What's going on, everybody? We have an awesome episode for you today. Nick Mayer is an artist, and uh, we have a our, our paths have crossed many times without ever meeting one another in Key West, in Alaska, in all over the place. Nick has done a lot of things and had many near-death experiences. He's here not to brag about those things, but just kind of to talk about them. And he tells some really amazing stories about how these experiences have influenced what he does for a living, realizing that every day is a gift and you need to do exactly what you love. If that if that resonates with you, you definitely want to listen to this episode. And if you're a wrestler, there is a lot of wrestling talk in here. Not pro wrestling, but amateur wrestling about life lessons and uh, work ethic and different things like that. So Nick Mayer, coming up. Hi, I'm Nick Mayer. I'm an artist, and this is a Tom Rowland podcast. Nick, man, how are you doing this morning? I'm pretty good. Yourself? Doing, doing great, man. I'm glad to have you on here. We have a lot of, a lot of cool things to talk about. I've, I've uh, been reading through all of your stuff and looking at your art, and man, you got, you got a lot of cool stories. That's for sure. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. Um, where, where are you living right now? So I'm actually in Vermont. Believe it or not, you okay. know, I, uh, despite it's kind of like a running joke around here that, uh, you know, all my art, um, well, most of my art depicts saltwater species, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm landlocked in, in the hills of Vermont. I mean, I'm, I'm also a big deer hunter. So, oh, yeah? um, so how's the deer you know, season been here. so far? Uh, well, it's just about to get started here. I mean, um, bow season's already, already, um, started, but I, I'm mainly a rifle hunter. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's it's starting to get cold, but that's sort of like what kind of gets gets us all thinking about deer season. <laughs> Do you think that so, um, the 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 distance from the ocean and the saltwater species that I mean, I see that you're doing a lot of tarpon and different mm -hmm. you know uh, warmer water kind of stuff. Do you think that the the difference or like the distance that you put between yourself and and those fish helps your art? Have you ever thought about that? Like. When you go back, like maybe you go and you go on a fishing trip and you're you're getting a lot of photographs and, and you're getting mm -hmm. motivation for your next few series of paintings or whatever. And then you retreat to Vermont. And does that kind of put you in a creative spot like you you are you think you're more creative there? Or do you think you'd be more creative right by the ocean uh, next to the species that you're that you're painting? You know, that's a, that's a really good point. I never, I never thought about that before. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, one of my favorite species to fish for, you know, around here are muskie and because they're right out of my doorstep here, um, you know, I kind of take them for granted and, um, you know, well, I did grow up in Rhode Island and fishing for striper, striped bass, stripers. And, um, you know, when they're, when they're right there, you're, you're not as, you, you tend to, I think you tend to take the species that are right outside your doorstep for granted. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I think, I think that very well could be, you know, like go on a trip and then you got these great memories and sort of inspiration for, for doing some creative stuff. Yeah. No, I can see that. I, I really, I really think that, um, you know, in a lot of ways that I, that applies to my life too, in some ways to, to get, mm -hmm. put a little distance between what you're trying to create. And, and, um, you know, it seems to, it seems to kind of put you in a creative space that maybe you wouldn't be in otherwise. And maybe that's, maybe that's mm -hmm. just, uh, taking, taking the species that are right there for granted, or I don't know, like if it, I think about like a trip that I've taken either to like Australia or to, um, Christmas Island or something. And you get over there and you see things that you've never seen before. And that has like this indelible mm -hmm. memory in your mind. Whereas if you go mm -hmm. out and you see a mahi, it's a beautiful fish. It has every bit the same coloration and 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 vibrant colors as as a, a you know a trigger fish that we saw in Christmas Island. But for some reason, like that has like such an impact on you because you've just never mm -hmm. seen it or you don't see it. It's very rare to see, and uh, mm -hmm. that would seem to inspire. If I could, if I could draw or paint <laughs> that would inspire me to do so which is interesting because this is something that I wanted to to ask you because I'm looking okay. at something I printed off of your oh off of gosh. your website right and uh, and this yeah. is this is super interesting to me because I I was looking at this and I'm looking at um 
these these drawings, sketches that you had when you were a kid, 1975, mm -hmm. whale sketchbook drawing circa 1975, helmet diver sketchbook drawing circa 1975, creatures sketchbook drawing circa 1975. So if you can see this, like that looks just about like the drawings I made when I was a kid. Okay? Uh -huh. And then you go down here to when you're in college and something happened here. Because these are like unbelievable, unbelievable drawings that are so precise and so accurate and so detailed. Now, of course, you get older and everything, but I mean, what happened? <laughs> how did you how did you get so much better? And like, I mean, when if anyone is to look at this, is like, yeah, these are mm -hmm. just like the kid, the drawings that my my kid brings home from from school mm -hmm. well i mean um my my dad was an art professor and uh, my mom was a microbiologist so you know i i guess i you know i was kind of influenced by you know both sides of things you know i, I obviously i i uh, studied marine biology that's the path that i originally decided to go down i didn't think i'd ever be able to make a living as an artist um you know just it, it was something that i had always loved to do, but, you know, I never really thought of it as something as a, like a career option. Science just seemed like a much more stable way to go. And, um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, my, so I grew up in Michigan and then, uh, well, for my first five years and then really did most of my, um, um, younger years in, in road living in Rhode Island. And, um, so like I said, my dad was a, a college professor and he'd always like at the end of the the school year, like the, the kids would leave all their supplies and stuff and, you know, go home for the summer or whatever. And he'd, he'd bring home like boxes of all like art supplies. So I had a never ending supply of art supplies in my house. And, you know, he, he, he didn't like, he, he definitely like taught me how to draw and stuff, but it wasn't sort of like, you know, you gotta be an artist. You gotta learn how to draw. It was just sort of like, he'd see me, uh, doing stuff and, you know, give me some pointers, but I mean, I don't know what it was. I just so always was a uh, drawing. Like when I was like in sixth grade or, you know, in elementary school, like I'd always be doodling in my notebooks and kids would be like, Oh, can, can you draw me a picture of ET? Or, you know, can you draw me this or that? And, you know, the teacher would have me like do the bulletin boards, you know, like collages and stuff. And I don't know. I was just kind of like, Oh, I was, I've always been, for some reason, like interested in aquatic things and always been kind of like interested in art and doodling. And that's how I sort of make sense of things. Like when we're trying to figure something out, you know, like, well, how, you know, something wrong with the house and we're trying to figure it out. I got to make a drawing of it hmm. to sort of, all right, so this is, this is how the plumbing goes. All right. So maybe it's here or whatever, you know, like yeah. uh, it's just how I kind of understand things is by the, the visual. That's super cool. Yeah, everybody has a different way of putting it together, you know. Like, mm -hmm. um, that's super cool. Well, something, something definitely happened between between the time <laughs> that you were nineteen seventy five. I don't know if you're. We're we're probably close to the same age, I guess. I don't know. Um, but when I was a kid, they had those little art tests that you would you would do in the mm -hmm. back of the magazines, and it was like you would draw like Mickey Mouse or you would draw like a mm -hmm. you know something. And man, I would be so inspired to do that. I was like, yeah, I could draw that. And mm -hmm. it, it didn't didn't look very good, so I, I never became an artist. But I never I never um, I never had anyone that like showed me how to do it like at all. Like I think maybe the the inspiration of having the art supplies and seeing a lot mm -hmm. of art around, you know, maybe that maybe that made a big difference. I don't know. Something yeah, happened I mean, because I, you're I, you're I, pretty good now. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Thank you, but. Uh... Yeah, I, mean, I kind of think it's like anything else to a certain degree where you just do it enough and you just keep getting better and better at it. Um, you know, kind of like fishing, you, you put your put your hours in or like with deer hunting, you know, a, a lot of times I feel like that's it's just like you got to log the time for sure. And, uh, and then you eventually get some success. But yeah, well, uh, in order to, to get to know you a little bit better and to get this conversation kicked off, we're going to we're going to go to the hot seat. Right. So I got a bunch of different questions that we're going to okay. ask you. They're either or questions, kind of fast paced. Uh, don't put a lot of thought into mm -hmm. them. Just we'll just uh, okay. we'll just see where we go. All right. So you ready? 
Mm-hmm. Spinning rod, conventional or fly rod? Fly rod. Freshwater or saltwater? Saltwater. Would you have a reptile as a pet? Yeah, I do. I've had <laughs> lots of them. <laughs> <laughs> right on. What have you had? Uh-huh. Snakes? Oh, well, I, yeah, I've had snakes. So, you know, I've had a lot of s- sort of odd stories, you know, like um, just rescuing you know, I had a friend whose girlfriend's ex-boyfriend left a python in her basement and, and nobody like knew that it was there. And so I took this thing in and had some, uh, actually had some venomous rattlesnakes in, in my apartment at one time. Woo. Okay. Um, those actually, yeah. You win. But, there, I, I don't, I think that maybe there might've been one other guest that's, that has had a reptile as a pet or would uh, like to. Now, of course we've had yeah. some python hunters, on the podcast and they, they don't keep them as pets. They, they're getting rid of mm-hmm. them, but they, they're very comfortable with them. Uh, one of your favorite bands. Foo Fighters. Instagram or Twitter? Instagram. One thing you're afraid of. Well, I, I don't mean to sound like a wuss, but I'm not too fond of leeches. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Me either. Uh, Gamakatsu, Tiemco, owner or must add? Owner. Okay. Office, friends, or parks and rec? Parks and rec. One piece of technology outside of your phone that you rely on heavily? Uh, my MacBook Pro. Okay. Favorite fish? Mm-hmm. Mm. GT. Good choice. Coffee, tea, or energy drink? coffee mountains or beaches for vacation beaches favorite fishing movie or tv show Hmm. Hmm. let's see here boy um yako lucas uh youtube nice he's a former guest we've had him on a couple Uh times he's always got good stories uh winter olympics or summer olympics Winter. Favorite pro wrestler of all time? Um, can I can I go into folk style like oh, college? Or? Well, even yeah. better on this podcast, yeah. <laughs> but yes. Kale Sanderson. Okay. That would be a very good choice. If you could have yeah. a fishing-themed superpower, what would it be? Or hunting. Mm. The ability to hover. <laughs> that would be a good one, like a drone. Uh, you do have uh, that now. That's your other piece of technology that yeah. you like. Sunrise or sunset? Sunset. Country, classic, rock, or rap? Rock. Pancakes or waffles? Waffles. Early bird or night owl? Night owl. River, lake, or back country? Back country. What would you consider to be one of the best catches of your career? Oh, boy. Um, let's see here. You know, um, hmm. Boy, a sailfish on a fly in Guatemala. I'd have, maybe i go with that. Okay, that's a good one. Um, uh-huh. A movie that makes you laugh. <laughs> um. Uh, let's see here. How about um, what's what's the Jack Black movie where he's the the wrestler in uh, in Mexico? Nacho Libre. Nacho Libre. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that one's good. The, yeah. uh, uh, text or calls? Calls. The last book you remember reading, or your favorite book? Mm, um. Let's see. I'm reading. Um, I'm reading some Raven Carver uh, short stories right now. Um, okay. okay. East Coast or West Coast? East Coast. East Coast or West Coast of Florida? Mm, West Coast right now is what I'm exploring. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. Early fishing memory or trip that made you a lifetime angler or hunter? Um, 
my first my first straight bass on a fly when I was like twelve, and um, it was just completely blew my mind. Never never expected it would happen. Where did that happen? That was in Rhode Island. I, I had a few buddies that we would I fished with since I was yeah could walk and um, we would mostly fish largemouth bass and um, you know catfish with spinning rods and um, then we started getting into salt water and we were fishing this um, this rocky point and I brought my fly rod and I tied a, a lefty's deceiver just like looked at a book and um, I think it was a lefty's uh, lefty gray book and um, tied it and walked down down the beach from these guys and um, just started casting the casting the fly and I think what happened was I, I spooked some silver sides that were close to the rocks and they went out and this striper started busting right in front of me threw the fly out there and and he nailed it right away and somehow I landed this fish it was like a seven weight fiberglass <laughs> rod from Kmart um, with a little like rinky dink reel and I didn't let the fish run I just held on I didn't know what to do and somehow I landed this fish and um, yeah my friends couldn't even believe me I was like screaming I, I I held it up in the air and then I let it go and they're like that was a piece of styrofoam come <laughs> on <laughs> <laughs> and that that did it that hooked you yeah. for life right there um, yeah. a place you'd like to visit Seychelles me too. Audio, mm -hmm. paper, or Kindle for books? Paper. Chocolate or vanilla? Vanilla. One piece of advice that has served you well? Don't give up. I like it. Is that from, uh, from your childhood? Who, who, who is the don't give up inspiration? Uh, my wrestling coach. Oh, yeah? Nice. Um, so yep. you, you wrestled uh, in high school? Did you wrestle in college? Just... No, just in high school. Yeah. yeah. Nice. I I wasn't I wasn't like a uh superstar. My son was I, I coached him. He was became a two time state champion. But wow, nice. I mean, in I, what uh, state? Vermont? Vermont, yeah. Wow, nice. But uh I mean I it just changed my life. I mean I I uh I was the hardest working guy on the team and you know, I, I wasn't the most successful guy on the team, but it uh it just taught me a lot of good life skills for sure, man. Yeah. So, so important for my, for my life. Mm -hmm. I, I think about, um, the, the life skills and the lessons I learned on the wrestling mat, um, probably more valuable than what I learned in high school, definitely more valuable than what I learned in college and probably, um, has attributed to a tremendous amount of any success that I've had in any endeavor beyond that. Like wrestling is mm -hmm. just, I, I, I could never say enough nice things about wrestling. How, how was it when you had, um, had kids? I don't know. How many kids do you have? I have two boys, two boys. Yeah. Did they both wrestle in 17? Uh, no, just my older son. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. was it, um, like, did you introduce them to wrestling or did he go to wrestling on his own? Well, you know, of course, uh, as a, as someone that had been so affected by the sport, I, I wanted to just throw him right in. And, um, but you know, my wife was like, you know, he's got to want to do it himself. And, um, so we, we kind of introduced him to it and, and I was just really tickled when, uh, when he decided he wanted to do it. And then I started coaching him and ended up coaching him all the way through, like, you know, from, I think he started in first grade and, and then he, he did wrestle in college. He, um, so you so had the transition of you had the transition of being uh, his coach and then having to be just another parent at some point when he graduated to real <laughs> what I call real coaches because I did the same thing I I coached my kids yeah. when they were young and then all the way into high school and then mm -hmm. it's like okay now you need real coaches and and uh, I'm backing away yeah. here so here's a question for yeah. you that I wish I had put on the thing but how do you think it's it's or or do you think it's more difficult to be a wrestler, a wrestling coach, or a wrestling parent, and why? Oh boy! I mean, it's definitely the toughest to be a wrestler because you're the one that's sucking the weight and you know wrecking your body and um, just giving it you know your all every day in practice. And um, so I think you know that's harder than. Well, that's physically harder than, for sure, than, uh, you know, anything a coach or a parent's going to do. But um, 
I mean, coaching really has its challenges too. <laughs> uh, you know, dealing with parents and um, <laughs> like trying to, you know, the the level the level of self control that rest the sport of wrestling teaches you really comes into play when you're when you're a coach and you got to deal with you know when you're about to blow your blow your top and you have to deal with you know a bad call and a ref or. Uh, or, you know, a, a parent who thinks their kid can't do any wrong or whatever. But um, I'd have to say the wrestler, you know, the wrestler's got the toughest job. Yeah, I would. I actually my gut instinct was to go at it actually opposite of that. Oh, yeah. Because as I was the wrestler, then I was the wrestling coach and then I had to be just the mm -hmm. wrestling parent. And over the t over the difference of, of those three, as the wrestler, you have the most control over what's happening, right? You you can work uh -huh. harder. You can you can do the work necessary to get better. It's all up to you. And that's those that one of the biggest lessons that wrestling teaches anyone is that this is this is all you. It's like extreme ownership at the extreme level uh, for a young kid in these competitions. You're going to go out there against one other person, and it's all you. And what's going to happen on that mat is a direct result of what has happened the last couple of months or the last couple of years or mm -hmm. whatever. And so that's all up to you. If you want to beat that kid, you absolutely can, but you have to put in the work to, to do it. So that one, mm -hmm. you have the most control. As the wrestling coach, then you have less control of what's going on, but still you're close to it and you're kind of... You could still maybe have a little set, little influence on what's going on, mm -hmm. or at least feel like you do. And then as a wrestling parent, where you're you're back there on the on the bleachers, like all the other wrestling parents, and and you, you, there it's just you, there's nothing <laughs> there's nothing you can do yeah. at any nothing at all. And so you're mm -hmm. completely. And I found that like whew, this is the hardest. Like and and now I'm having to sit. Well, the real hardest is not just with my wife. She she was really good. She learned how to do it, you know, just like all wrestling uh -huh. moms, you know, when to scream and when to be quiet and when to, mm -hmm. you know, do whatever. But it's with these other wrestling parents that have never been to a wrestling match, and they're asking, well, okay, what's going on now? And it's like, <laughs> I would just go sit in the corner, like as far away as possible, and uh -huh. uh, and just kind of... I don't know. I found it to be very difficult, but it's interesting the different perspectives on that. I've, I've, I hope one day I'll be a wrestling grandparent, and maybe that'll uh -huh. be harder or easier. I don't know. But um, oh my gosh, yeah, I totally, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I was my, my first, uh, my first college. Uh, wrestling tournament i'm just like i'm like in the stands yeah, like you know like course. oh like uh, sometimes i did scream and then i'm like oh no you shouldn't be doing that let him co let the coach yell like what movie you should do and oh it was so hard it is <laughs> it is it is incredibly hard it mm -hmm. really is you know when i when i was guiding um daily in key west i i would run across you know somebody that would come on the boat and they're a really good fisherman and they were obviously very athletic but they had like something about them that they were just really, like really into it, and I would always ask like what their uh, background was in athletics, and there was an uncanny number of anglers that were like into tournaments and really good, like way better than your average guy, and mm -hmm. and they were really good. And when I asked them what their background in athletics was, a big percentage were wrestlers. A big mm -hmm. percentage. And I started thinking, like, huh, that is so interesting. I wonder what it is about wrestling and technical fishing, like fly fishing or even, you know, technical bait fishing for permit and bonefish. It can be as difficult as fly fishing mm -hmm. or sometimes even more difficult as fly fishing, as you know. But, but it drew these people to the sport. Like, and it obviously drew you to the sport or you were drawn to the sport of, of fishing and also to wrestling. I wonder what kind of, um, mm -hmm. why do you think that is that, that it's such a wide, uh, such a big percentage of people that, that like one sport, like the other, you know, that's a good, that's a good question too. I mean, um, 
you know, I, I think I agree with you, you know, like there's, there's a lot of uh, sort of precision that's involved with wrestling. All right. You know, so you got, you got to put your right foot here. It can't be here. You got to grab the guy's heel. You can't grab his calf. You got to grab the heel or whatever, you know, and the same, like you got to present the fly or the, the bait there. It can't be like 10 inches this way, or you're going to spook the fish. You know, there's, there's sort of like that, the element of precision maybe, mm -hmm. but yeah, I see um, that for sure. And I always kind of thought too that it was like wrestling is is physical chess. Like it's a physical chess. You you've heard um a lot of people like you, you know coaches and different people will will describe the sport that way. And it is that mm -hmm. way. There's a lot of strategy, there's a lot of precision. A smaller person can defeat a larger person if they have better technique or better strategy or or you know, like you can just see kids that are not as strong as other kids and they just whoop them you know like it's it's very very technical and then wrestling mm -hmm. i think um you benefit from your work ethic and how hard you're willing to to practice and drill and and then you also benefit from your coaches right so um it's the same in, in that type of fishing. Like if you have somebody that's willing to put in the time and practice casting and practice casting, willing to put in the time and read and watch videos and everything like that, and then willing to seek out the best fishing guide that they can go with and then learn from that person, it's almost like the same type of process that, that a wrestler mm -hmm. goes through to get really, really good. And when, when you are, are a wrestler either through high school or through college, and you stop doing that, unless you're going to the UFC these days, like that comp competitive part of your life that you don't even realize, you know, mm -hmm. at the time when you stop doing it, you're like, well, I'm glad that's over, right? I'm good. I'm good to be done with it. But a couple months later, you're like, something's missing. You don't even know what it is, but there is a competitive aspect to your life that you've had since you were in kindergarten where every single day you were competing in a basically, your brain probably thought, a life or death struggle here, and you win or you lose. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden that's just over? It's just gone? You don't do it anymore? Like, I think people, I think a lot of wrestlers have to find something, whether it's CrossFit or fishing or hunting or, or archery or something that they can mm -hmm. apply those steps to of practice, 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 getting better, better, better. And then, you know, a, a big challenge, like. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely felt like that. I, I think, uh, it was, I guess it was my freshman year of college when I didn't wrestle in college. I went to Brown and it was D1 school and um, yeah, it was recruit only. And um, so they didn't really take walk-ons, but uh, yeah, I just felt like this hole in my life. I remember I actually called my high school coach and I was just like, wanted to talk to him. And, <laughs> and after a while he's like, what'd you call me for? <laughs> he didn't really get it. I was just like, oh, I just, I don't know. I just had, I missed it. Right. Yeah, well, yeah I know. That's, that's, I think that's real common. Um, well, let's talk about your, let's talk about your art a little bit. I think that, um, well, you got, you got so many talking points on here. I mean, you've, you've done commercial fishing, recreational fishing, fishing, um, in order to kind of get, get, uh, ideas for your art. How does all this start and where did, how, how do you get from where you started to, being the artist that you are today? Um, well, I mean, I guess my interest in fishing just started when I was a little kid, um, you know, back in the eighties, as, um, you know, I, I assume you grew up in the eighties too, yeah. you know, there were no such thing as hover parents and us kids, we just would go and, uh, there was this little like polluted little frog pond near our house that, uh, all the kids would hang out at. And, um, you know, there were never any parents around and, um, you know, we'd just be catching turtles. My nickname was the turtle man when I was a little kid, cause I just catch so many turtles. Um, I, 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 there was actually a, a, a culvert like this, this grate that would, um, the, the pond, it was called Willet Pond in Riverside, Rhode Island. And, um, there's this great that like a trash filter that uh, would the 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 water from the pond would go down over this waterfall like underneath the the street and I'd squeeze between the bars of that and jump down the waterfall and I was like in this uh, crazy like little 
cement room with full of snap, big snap and turtles and <laughs> kept these snap and turtles. And, um, yeah, so I, that's where I sort of, I think it all started was with the catching and, uh, there's this motorcycle gang that would hang out in the parking lot and like nobody got hurt nobody drowned and we'd be in the mud this deep every day catching stuff and there was never any issues but um I, you know was, i think just like that exploring you know on my own exploring and uh, that kind of stuff and then you know that, that sort of segued into uh spin fishing mostly for bass and then like i said i was uh you know somewhat close to the coast so um we then started my my fishing buddies uh from my town we would we uh started moving into uh salt water and then fly fishing um i was introduced to that through um a, a guy at the orbits company in in uh, manchester vermont yeah you're right there uh-huh right? yeah yeah it's it's uh just a little way south of us now um but my uncle, I go and visit him in the summertime. He he was a, a college teacher up in uh, Bennington, Vermont, and he took me to the Orvis uh, flagship store there. And um, I just happened to meet this guy, or uh, Gordy Hines, who actually he lives. He's he's an artist now. Um, he was uh, he worked at, you know in sales and in, in um, different hunting and and um, and fishing venues for for a number of years. But now he he's in Destin, Florida. But um, anyway, he he kind of took me under his wing and um uh really introduced me to to fly fishing just a really generous guy gave me all kinds of gear and taught me how to fish and i mean that's what really got me inspired to fly fish that's cool um then how do you end up in alaska well um so then yeah so then uh i decided to to um study fisheries in in college um i had had an awesome time at Duke at uh, studying marine biology. I, I, I went to Brown, but then I uh, did some um, specific marine biology studies in in uh, at Duke, and and that really uh, got me inspired to to work. You know, like um, you know, at the population uh, bio, population biology level of uh, with fisheries, and um, got this. Uh, got this internship working for Alaska Fish and Game. Um, yeah, the summer before my senior year and went out there and um on kodiak island which was that yeah. was an adventure yeah <laughs> everywhere you everywhere you went you, you went by float plane because there was no roads anywhere it was either boat or float plane and um so I, all those seasonal um all those uh like entry level fisheries jobs like when you're fresh out of college or you know about to be out of college they're all seasonal so i was just you know like we we're we we're doing some research on the uh the effects of the Exxon Valdez oil spill up there. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah, um, of course. I think that was in the no- early 90s. Uh-huh. Um, um, so we were doing some research on the effects of the the oil spill on the salmon, which, believe it or not, it, it really helped them out because it stopped the commercial fishing oh. and uh, allowed all the salmon to get back into the rivers instead of being caught. Wow. But uh, <laughs> So that's how I ended up in Alaska, and that, that was a seasonal job, and then that ended. And then... Um, I had uh, already done some commercial fishing in Rhode Island and I uh, just was started walking the docks and got a, uh, jumped on a boat that uh, somebody um, couldn't take anymore and quit and um, got on a got on a commercial uh, purse stainer up there. So that was that was pretty cool. I would imagine that that's uh, the, the wrestling background came in handy in the in the commercial fishing industry. Um, that's hard work. I mean, that's it is. I don't care what you're fishing for. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, maybe the easiest commercial fishing is like stone crabbing in the Florida Keys. I've always thought that'd be a great TV show. Just like you got the deadliest catch and then you got the easiest catch uh, of like stone crabbing. But even stone crabbing, man, it's uh-huh. like, you know, like commercial fishing, no matter what you're fishing for, it's a hard job. You got to go out yeah. in the worst weather. You've got to, like, I mean, just everything about it is is rough and tough and Mm -hmm. that is what how did you how did you um what what were you doing in rhode island what kind of commercial fishing there uh i worked on a a clam dredger um yeah actually so every every uh commercial fishing boat that i worked on i basically had a near-death experience (laughs) but um i believe it i mean (laughs) can you have a can you have a near-death death experience on a clam dredger 
I don't even know I, what I don't even know how yeah, those so, operate. Like what so what is this, what does that was, look uh, like? It was a hundred and uh, I think it was a hundred and forty eight feet foot long um, this giant metal uh, boat, and we had this monstrous uh, metal cage. You know, it was probably oh uh, like maybe like a thirty foot by twenty foot metal cage that um, we just drag along the bottom, and you just dredge up every everything on the bottom there was you know it's so environmentally incorrect and then it would get raised up on this a-frame and and um it just dump everything onto a conveyor belt and i was the you know because i was the new guy i was the lowest guy in the totem pole i had the first conveyor belt so it went through a couple of few conveyor belts yeah. and, um, you know, the guy further on down, he didn't have to take as much off, but I'm like constantly, I'm taking like seaweed. We get like little, like these little missiles, you know, from like World War II or something. Huh. You remember those, those little missiles that those little things that you could put caps in when you're a kid yeah. and you'd throw them in the cap yes. and go off. They look like that, like a little, uh, thing with these fins on them. Uh -huh. Um, and, and like, you know, all kinds of like could those be like live metal. charges? Some I think some the, <laughs> we never we never got any that were live, but you know I bet you definitely could. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah. So I, my job was working this conveyor belt, and I'd just be like kind of in my head doing this stuff, and I had these different milk crates in front of me, you know, that I'd throw the bycatch in, you know, like one for scallops, another one for monkfish or something, and uh, this. This old salt came up to me and he said, "There's a monkfish in that cage. You gotta, you gotta go take a gaff and go get him." So I, I climbed up there and, and gaffed this fish out and, um, and then I went back to my job and I'm just sitting there. I was the only guy on the whole deck for some reason, um, and all of a sudden these ta all the tables in front of me just exploded into splinters, and I had no idea what happened. Like. I, I'm just like st sitting there dumbfounded, like all these milk crates are gone, all the, there's like this plywood table, it's all gone. And uh, everybody starts running around it. And there was like a, a metal cable, a giant metal cable that held that cage and it broke. And it, when, when the cage fell in the water, the, whole, the cable came by me and smashed those tables wow. and like vaporized those tables. <laughs> wow. So yeah, that was, that was uh, a close call for sure. Man. Uh -huh. And then uh, did you continue that or you think maybe that's kind of the, the first uh, first indication that it might be time to move on to uh, some other line of work? Uh, well, that <laughs> boat, I, I realized that not everybody was on that boat was um, sober at all times. Yes. <laughs> including the captain. And um, plus we lost the cage so we couldn't fish anymore. And, you know, it was. Yeah, so I moved on from that, but um And so what was the what and compare that to what kind of commercial fishing you were doing in Alaska? Well, in Alaska, I mean, I I was just I was just at that time in my life, you know, when I was, yeah, it was like all in my like 20s. Um I was just like all out for adventure. I didn't care. Like I I just wanted to go out and go on the high seas and you know it was the a biggest rush for me i, I kind of felt like the on that commercial boat in alaska it was sort of almost like being on a football team you know like you kind of had these plays where uh you know one guy would come around with with the the tractor jet this little skiff and and uh throw you a line and then you had to clip it on this thing and then you got to run over here and pull this quick release and this thing goes shooting out and you know, it was a whole sequence of these different things that we all had to do together as a team in order for the whole thing to work right. And, um, yeah, I mean, that was, we would work 21 hours a day and, um, uh, the sleep deprivation was just like over time that just would accrue and, uh, you know, just sleeping three hours a night and being on this boat with this, one other uh most of the time it was just uh, it was a crew of four and it was just uh this other native alley that uh i was on the deck with because the captain was always in the bridge and uh and the other guy was in the in the tractor jet so i was, like, spent like weeks at a time with this guy and it just yeah it drove me crazy but uh was everybody young or were there a couple the of captain was i think i'd say the captain was i think he was in his his 50s wow. and then 
Um, yeah, the rest of us were the art, the other guy that, uh, um, worked on the deck with me. He, um, he was like, I think he was probably in his twenties too. And then, um, can't remember the, the guy in, uh, in the in the skiff, the the skiff had spray painted on it haywire, so we just called him haywire. <laughs> he wasn't all there either, but um, and I tell you, that's a that seems like a young man's job uh, with all the sleep deprivation mm -hmm. and everything like that. I I, yeah. don't, I I don't know how how you would do that for a for a career like to, if that was that was your thing and you're you're going to be mm -hmm. working twenty one hours at a time. Um, mm -hmm. ooh, that's tough. And at this point, are you? Um, are you uh, still doing art like when you're working like that, or does that kind of go on the back burner for a little bit? That kind of was on the back burner, but I do have actually right here in my studio. I got my uh, my sketchbook from Alaska, and um, so I kept a sketchbook while I was on the boat. I think that might have been kind of part of what kept my sanity, honestly. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I, uh, I read books and. Um, you know, cause we would, we'd have like this sequence of events we do and we set the net and then we'd have like 15 minutes to wait and then we'd have to do it again. And so there are like little periods of downtime. So maybe, you know, like sometimes you try to get like 15 minutes of sleep or whatever, but yeah, the other wow. guy had to watch to make sure he, he woke you up when it was time to go. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's tough, man. That, that is tough, mm -hmm. uh, tough tough life uh the commercial fishing in alaska I've, I've talked to a couple of people when they come back from all different types of fishing it sounds like you were doing something different than what my friend was doing but i mean man he showed me pictures uh the few pictures that he took um just of like the whole front rail of that whole boat was just encased in ice and they would mm -hmm. have to go up there and hit it with sledgehammers and knock all that ice off uh -huh. and then his job was throwing some kind of a hook so that he could catch a buoy and like you're talking about, if he missed that thing, mm -hmm. it was not good. You might have like mm -hmm. two or three tries at this buoy, and mm -hmm. then, and so you're you're bringing that rope in and then throwing that thing out, and and it's cold and wet, and and you got to hit it every time, uh, or or the whole boat has to turn around and go like that, mm -hmm. and that's not the captain's not going to be happy about that. But when I saw him, he looked like he had lost forty pounds. And he looked like the life was literally sucked out of him. And he had already been home for weeks, right? Uh -huh. Like, I <laughs> went to lunch with this guy. I was like, my God, what happened to you? And he was like, that's commercial fishing for you. I was uh -huh. like, okay, uh, respect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? a, lot of that, a lot of those guys, you know, you make a lot of money in a short period of time. And then they, a lot of those guys go to uh, Hawaii. Yes. You know, that's the closest, you know, for, for us, you know, like uh, Florida is like the closest tropical place, but out there, it's like everybody just goes to Hawaii. Yeah. And then uh, that's where they kind of lay on the recharge. beach, warm up and eat yeah. uh -huh. and, and eat. Yeah, man. So, uh, well, after Alaska, um, how do you kind of move into, uh, well, you're, what? You survived a near, near death float plane crash while caribou hunting in, a, in Labrador? Mm. Man, yeah, you're like so, a um, cat. You have uh, how many <laughs> yeah. lives do you have left? I don't know. I mean, I, well, I, I also uh, fell overboard off of that boat in Alaska. Really? I, um, yeah. I mean, and that's. I think that's really what made me feel like I had a guardian angel because um, I just. I don't know. I mean, I'll just tell you that story real quick. So you know how we were doing that thing. I was telling you about the the uh, the football play. Like we blew a hydraulic hose and um sprayed hydraulic fluid all over the deck oh gross and we had to yeah we we tried to mop this mess up and it just the deck was still super slippery and i was doing that thing and i slid all the way from one side of the deck all the way to the other backwards and then flipped over backwards off of the boat into oh. the water and um my raincoat i didn't have a flotation device on I just had my raincoat buttoned up to my uh, chin and and it filled up with air and floated me up and then I, I see the stern of the boat going straight away oh, from no. me because uh, the captain didn't know I fell in and um, did anybody see I, you go in um, Art the other guy that was on deck so he told the captain but what I did was I I uh, I saw the uh, the other skiff and um, a line hanging off of that yeah haywire <laughs> so then I pulled myself over there and and got into that boat. But that was that was a close call. And um, what 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 are the temperatures on a in this 
kind of yeah. situation. You didn't have much time, you know, before the hypothermia set in. So uh, I was pretty lucky. I, I was able to get into that boat pretty quick. And were you able to warm up uh, on on deck or in the in the uh, down below? I was. I mean, I, I honestly, I got back on the boat and I just started, I did some jumping jacks and um, we had to finish that set. And then after that, then I go went and changed my clothes. See, that's what I'm talking about. The wrestling, <laughs> the wrestling benefited you. I mean, right. you go in, uh -huh. you're soaking wet uh -huh. and you're expected to finish the set. That sounds yeah. a lot like making weight, <laughs> like, except it it's hot, not cold. Uh -huh. um, yeah, man, that's uh, yeah. geez. And then, so how many other how many other near death experiences have you had? Well, I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm not I'm not like to, here to brag about these things. I, I think it's just honestly, it's just these these experiences just kind of made me realize that every day is a gift, and you just got to do what you love. And you know, that's sort of what kind of eventually steered me to becoming a full time artist. But um, yeah, the caribou hunting. Um, I mean, I had this absolutely phenomenal hunt um up on the labrador um quebec border shortly after that they closed caribou hunting in all of canada and um and it hasn't opened back up since as far as i know really because they had had this uh the um they had some kind of parasite that caused the population to crash this was the barren ground um caribou um, you know, there's like woodland caribou and barren ground and, and yeah. these are the barren ground, the ones that do the big migration and everything. Mm -hmm. But, um, but yeah, so, so the way that people, um, the, the pilots, uh, navigate up there, these, these planes were like literally from the fifties, there's no electronics on them or anything. Um, which is kind of interesting, you know, like they're like spinning these wheels and, and pulling and pumping these things and, you know, to, to get the, I don't know what all the terms are for the, you know, the flaps and the wings and everything to, to get everything going. But, um, the only thing he had was he had a little, uh, the pilot had a little suction cup with a, with a cell phone on the windshield. Um, but basically they just use sight for navigation. And, um, so when you, when you come into like a, a big wall of clouds, what they usually do is they either go along the edge or just land in a, in a pond or a lake and, and wait out the, the bad weather until you mm -hmm. got clear skies again. And we kept doing that. We kept going along the edge of the, the clouds. And, and then, um, finally he just said, you know, screw it. We're just going to go right through. And, um, I looked at the other guy next to me. He was a, um, ex military helicopter pilot. So he had some, uh, or I'm not sure if he was a pilot, but he was like, had something to do with helicopters and, you know, we kind of looked at each other and then I looked at the, the dashboard and there was a red light that said f fuel. Oh boy. And I said, I you know what's up with that. And the, I didn't realize there were two fuel tanks. So, but that was just the first one. But anyway, I, I think we were getting a little low on fuel and decided to go through this, this cloud. And all of a sudden we come, it was like something from a movie, you know, we're all looking through the windshield. I was, I was right the next seat right behind the pilot and I'm looking through the windshield and you know, everything's just white. And then all of a sudden we see this rock face <gasps> and he just did like one of these, like, you know, turn the plane sideways and everybody's like all their rifles and hunting gear comes falling off, you know, the, onto one side of the plane and we're all like hanging on sideways. And, uh, yeah, that was, that was, that was pretty interesting. Did you go interesting. down? No, we, we, we just like, you know, did this bank and, um, you know, just did like a, a 90 degree turn. I mean, had those clouds not that clear a, a second later, you'd mm -hmm. have been smack into that, that cliff. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's wild. How, well, how's your fondness with uh, float planes these days and helicopters? Do you like them or not? You know, I, I don't, I don't mind them. I mean, you know, that was, that was just one, one flight of, of many. So, I mean, it, like I said, like in Alaska, people, it just, kind of, it was like a bicycle or yeah. a car. You just use it to get from one place to another. And yeah, the postman um, uses it like, that's how they deliver the mm -hmm. mail in yeah, a lot of cases. Exactly. And that's how they yeah. deliver groceries, uh -huh. and and they probably have Uber up there for float planes. I mean, they probably <laughs> do. Like, I mean, why, why wouldn't they? Yeah, like, wonder. that's how you get uh -huh. around. Um, yeah. Wow, that's that's uh, that's crazy. So, with all these near death mm -hmm. experiences, I mean, you touched on it just for for a second there. 
um, that that's why you know you 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 realize that every day is a gift and and to do what you love. Mm -hmm. What you know, at what point do you do you kind of make a change in your life or 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 actually you know you you come upon this realization like you've been really lucky a couple of times here, mm -hmm. and then and then what? Like what do you do? You're just like I'm just going to do art, or had you? Um, like, how did that, I'm really interested in that decision because that's, that's like a major kind of turning point in your own life of, of realizing, mm -hmm. you know what, there are certain things that are important. There are certain things that are not important. And, and, and then you kind of identify, this is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Right. Is yeah, that how well, it went? I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it, 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 it gets, it's a little more complicated because, um, you know, somewhere in there afterwards, uh, I met my wife and, and um, we, we settled down and had a family. And so, you know, now I now I have, um, you know, a mortgage and and, um, you know, and then I had a, a kid in college, of course. Uh, so it it wasn't like, yeah, well, I know I love to paint. I'm going to go try that. No, right. I had to, I had to be a little more uh, strategic about it. So I, I started the business on the side and, um, kept growing it to the point where, you know, at a certain point, my, you know, my wife and I had the conversation and she just really supported me and said, you know, you, you got to try it. So I took the plunge and it, I mean, it, it, I'd say like, making a living as an artist has got to be the hardest thing anybody could want to do yeah. and, you know, actually do it long term. but somehow it worked out, you know, I just, uh, kept, kept at it. And, um, yeah, I think it's been, um, I think it's been like 12 years now that, wow. since I went full time. So yeah, I just, I mean, I had to try it. It wasn't, it, it was, I had grown the side business to the point where, you know, I think I thought, you know, I could, um, make a living at it. But what I didn't realize is that like once I was like fully invested in it and not doing it as a side thing, like then like there was another kind of uh, uh, growth factor associated with that, that really made things take off. It was like, also, I think it was like the day after I gave my notice that someone called me and asked me to illustrate a book. And that was my first book project. So it was really serendipitous and nice. So what was the what was the other job that you that you gave your notice to? What were you doing at that point? Um, well, I had, I was that's kind of a complicated um, uh, story, but um, I had worked you know in these various different um, science jobs um, in marine biology and and then environmental consulting, and then I was uh, I was basically a pers personal assistant to um, a billionaire that uh, um, was. Yeah, I was managing um, different properties and mm. doing all kinds of things. And and um, I just had um, I just uh, put so much of myself into that job that I, I it was just like too much, you know, like too much of my life was invested in that. And it wasn't like I was building, working towards someone else's dream rather than building my own dream. Right. So I just, you know, I felt like I just had to sort of be more true to myself and, um, you know, try and build my own dream. That's super cool. I love those, those stories. You know, we talked to a lot of different people that, that decided at some point that they wanted to be a fishing guide or they wanted to open a, a store. Like in your case, you mm -hmm. wanted to, you wanted to go full time into art or you wanted to go full time into some sort of athletics, like some of these CrossFit athletes that I've, have had on, mm -hmm. they, they just get to a point to where they're like, you know what? It's like, you know, it's never going to be that, Oh, all of a sudden my, my side gig kind of, I'm doing better in my side gig than I'm doing in my real job. It almost always is that the side gig has kind of shown some potential and now mm -hmm. you got to jump. Like, it's not like, Oh, now I don't even need this job anymore. I mean, re I'm mm -hmm. sure that there are plenty of situations like that for people, but for the people that have been on this podcast and, and have told a similar mm -hmm. story, it's like, no, it was there, but it certainly wasn't the main gig. Mm -hmm. And, there's a point where you have to jump and you have to communicate with your wife and you have to communicate with your family mm -hmm. and you have to be like, can I really do this? And then mm -hmm. it's that jump. And that's, that is the most important part of the whole journey. I think is that moment of saying, I'm doing it. I'm putting in my notice over here mm -hmm. and we're doing this 
for the good, for the bad, for whatever happens, mm -hmm. I'm in. You know, mm -hmm. I love that. That it, and did, also did, that it's been you, successful. Thank you. Yeah, was it was that sort of like a similar? Just curious, was that sort of like a similar kind of inflection point for you when you went from guiding to the saltwater experience? Like uh, that, there was sort of like a yeah jump to there been new... there been many jumps, um, mm. but I mean I, I, the first jump was. Um, I'm going to not do the Western guiding anymore and I'm only going to do the Florida guiding, but that one, you know, there's 365 days in Florida. I own my own business. So every time that I was doing a trip, I was making more than I was out West, but you're still giving something up to do that. And mm -hmm. then for a while, you know, nobody knows who you are or cares and you're, you're just learning your way around and you don't have enough money or business to really make it through the month. And I, re I think about this all the time is like, there was this moment where I'm talking to my wife. It's like, man, I should really get a job. It's like, wait, you know, as a waiter or a bartender or something. And cause we didn't have enough money to make it through the whole month. And, and she's encouraging just like your wife was of like, you know, I know you can do this. And then at that point, it's like, no, what I, what I need to do is not go out and get another job that takes me off the water. What I need to do is spend more time on the water and I know that that doesn't make any financial sense, and there's there's no way of seeing that that we're going to make it through the end of the month and be able to pay the rent. But if I spend more time on the water, I believe I'm going to get the trips. And if I just get one trip, one more trip, that's going to be eight nights of bartending, right? Like, and mm -hmm. so you put in your time, you show up at the ramp first, you you leave the ramp last. Sooner or later, another one of these fishing guides is going to be like, you know, that kid's working pretty hard. I'm going to throw him a bone. And then somebody else does that. And then you do a good job. And the next thing you know, you kind of built it up to where had you have played it safe and been the bartender, and there's nothing wrong with that. Some people have to do that, right? But mm -hmm. in this situation, my wife and I had just gotten married, no kids yet. And uh, it's like, I know this doesn't make sense, but I would rather burn this thing to the ground than compromise on my, my dream here. And if, mm -hmm. if, if we go and and we can't make it through the end of the month, then we'll figure something else out. But mm -hmm. my dream is not to be a part-time fishing guide and a bartender. My mm -hmm. dream is to be the best fishing guide in the Florida Keys. And that's a long way off. Like, I mean, coming from my, my experience level is like that is an impossible goal. That's an impossible dream. But I know I'm not going to get there by being a part-time guide. So go all in. And, mm -hmm. and there was that. But then, you know, with the TV show, same kind of thing. It's like, um, you know, we've got a full schedule of, of people. And, in fact, as I continued to guide and, and guide further and further and more and more and more, my client list got smaller and smaller and smaller, as generally happens with, with somebody that is doing, doing well at that profession. You're only fishing with three or four or five or six different people, and you're fishing more days than you ever have, right? Each one of them is taking 50, 60, 100 days. And, you know, oh, you're, wow. you're, you're very fortunate mm -hmm. to have clients like that, right? Like it, they become family. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then to give that up in pursuit of this other thing is tough. That's, that's a tough thing, but you gotta, you know, you, you, there's a lot of, there's a lot of turmoil and a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, introspective thinking of like, um, you know, I, this is what I want. And then going back to the wrestling deal of what, what wrestling has taught me in my life is that I'll bet on myself. I'm reluctant to bet on others because I don't know what what their work ethic is or what their history is but i know that if it takes hard work to get there and i'm determined i'll make that bet because i know like what wrestling has taught me and i know what hard work is and i know what dedication is and i know what doing things that you really don't want to do but doing them anyway, and like Mike Tyson says, doing them, and, and everyone else that's watching you just says, man, look at that guy. He loves what he's doing. <laughs> Not necessarily. It might be the worst mm -hmm. day you've ever had, but you still love doing it, right? And that's a bet that I'll make on myself. And that's obviously mm -hmm. a bet that you made on yourself is that you knew that this art was going to be, this, this artist's life is going to be very difficult 
but if it takes work and dedication, you are willing to make that bet on yourself. And good for you, man. That's that's just awesome. Thanks. I mean, it, it really you is. Too, I, man. Lo- I mean, I can totally see- I love hearing. I totally those see the wrestling mindset and you know <laughs> everything that you've done. Yeah, well, and, uh, I mean it, it's there, and and even if um, I like, I don't know. Sometimes with my daughter or something, I I, I struggle to to come up with stories or or whatever um, that don't involve wrestling because she didn't she didn't wrestle. Um, she might now with, with the, the growth of women's wrestling. Um, Mm -hmm. but you know, it wasn't a thing that she, she didn't really, girls and boys are different. She didn't really want to wrestle. She wants Mm -hmm. to do other, (laughs) she wants to do other things, but I kind of struggle with like teaching life lessons without wrestling because both my boys wrestled and with my Mm -hmm. wife, the same thing that, um, that, that you and your wife talked about is like, is really important that they, that they want to do this. But I had to kind of override that and say, you know what's really important, I think, in, in raising boys is that they learn the lessons that I was fortunate enough to learn. And so they're going to wrestle, and they may hate it, but they're going to be out there long enough for them to learn these lessons. And that's only a couple of years, honestly. You wrestle for a couple mm-hmm. of years, and you're, you've learned the lessons, and either you like it or you don't. And at that point, if mm-hmm. you don't want to do it anymore, that's fine. But... Mm-hmm. I wanted to introduce them to it, and I wanted them to wrestle at least some. And it turns out that both of them, um, at, in the end, enjoyed wrestling very much. There were a lot of battles amongst themselves mentally of, do I really like this or do I hate this? Or like, I think a lot of wrestlers feel that way because it is uh-huh. the toughest sport there is. And you were you were doing the toughest sport there is at a time in your life where all your friends are definitely not doing that. Like unless your friends right. are wrestlers, right? Like the mm-hmm. closest thing I could see to it was like the swim team was they were the only other team that was practicing twice a day. And mm-hmm. you know, but I mean like basketball, <sighs> cake. Yeah. You know, it like <laughs> soccer, like, okay, you're gonna run around for forty five minutes, that's that's cool. Like we've been running around since this morning, and we haven't mm-hmm. had anything to eat. Like, mm-hmm. you know? But um, it's uh, it, it's I I I just I don't know. I have a lot of great things to to say about wrestling, and probably people that listen to this podcast, if they're not wrestlers, they're really tired of hearing it. But <laughs> it's a it's a it's a I don't know. I mean, it's just a mindset, and it's a it's a a, a work ethic that is developed. That I don't know that there's many other. I'm sure that there's plenty of other ways to develop a great work ethic. But I don't know if it's as effective as the sport of wrestling or mm-hmm. as efficient as the sport of wrestling where you're going to get that quickly and everyone that does mm-hmm. it to, for, for a certain amount of time is going to develop that work ethic. I mean, I think especially in this day and age, you know, like it's that's such a valuable and even more and more unique thing, you know. And I, I mean, I 100% see that in my son uh, that, you know, he's even I think uh, – well, I don't know before before he could even like legally work he was he was doing construction and you know putting a stack of shingles on his shoulder and crawling to the top of a roof and you know I, I saw that work ethic like right off the bat and I know that it's it's it, once that's in you it's in you forever you know that the once you're a wrestler I feel like you're in that like wrestling brotherhood forever yes and what I think it's, is interesting about wrestling is that it's a very, very physical sport. And to a lot of people that don't know much about wrestling, it's a brutal sport. But it's mm-hmm. a very cerebral sport. Like, it, like we talked about, it's, it's, it's physical chess. And there's as much strategy in, 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 in wrestling as anything. And the really great wrestlers, like a Kale Sanderson or somebody like that, that guy is super smart. So smart. Mm-hmm. The people that are really good at it are not these dumb brutes. They are like really, really incredibly intelligent people that are learning mm-hmm. all about the physics of of the human body and and the 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 the, uh, the way that the mind works and how you can get in someone else's mind and how you can cr- you can work on your own mind. But they're all like it, it seems like a very brutal sport, but. What I think is really interesting about wrestling is that the things that you learn there can be applied to anything. Like if you were a good wrestler, I feel like you could learn how to play the violin. If you were a good wrestler, you could learn how to certainly be a good guitarist or a great fly fisherman or whatever. It's like there is a, 
a process and a procedure to getting good at anything. And wrestling is not, I'm not going to say it's the best way by any, by any stretch of the imagination, but it is a very efficient way to learn how to get better at something. And, and, uh, and that's been very um, beneficial for me just of, of like, okay, well, if I want to get better at fishing or guiding or poling a boat or rowing a boat, I know what needs to happen. I need to get out there and practice, and it would help if I had somebody that really knew how to do it that could show me how to do it, and I'm going to learn faster. But you know, you got to put in the work, no matter what it is. Mm-hmm. You got to put in the work, and um, that's that's pretty much what I learned from wrestling. But I love it. I want you to tell me your story about um, selling your first piece of art because it happened in Key West, and I'm uh-huh. pretty sure I know exactly where where it happened. Um, and, and that's, you know, we have a lot of, we have a connection there. So what was it like to sell your first piece of, of art and why did you even think about doing that? And why were you in Key West? Okay. So I'm sure you've heard of Sea Camp right over on oh, Big yeah. Pine. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So that was a, another place that I worked that had like a big influence on me. Um, uh, just, you know, taking kids out and teaching about the coral reef. That was just really rewarding. We go out to Luke, Luke mm-hmm. Key there. Beautiful spot. And, um, yeah. And, uh, there was just like a school bus, uh, that the staff, that was like the staff office, this old school bus. And I set up a little like station in there and, um, had a little desk with my paints. And, um, I painted this, um, is you know, painting was not too big of a painting, you know, what would fit in the little stall of the, of the, mm-hmm. in the school bus there of a tarpon over some turtle grass. And, uh, I just took it down to, to Key West. I found this gallery. It was called the game fish gallery. I don't yeah. think it exists anymore, yeah, but, but I know um, I, 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 I remember, I remember it. This is it, right? That's your painting. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's it. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's cool. It's really good. And so you take it in there and you're yeah, like, did you just yeah, need so money? I took or? it in there and like, I'm just, well, I, I mean, I didn't make very much money there. I was like, you know, the, again, the bottom, the guy, bottom guy on the totem pole. And, um, so I just, I went in there and, um, you know, again, like something from a movie, like some, some, uh, young inexperienced artist goes in there and they, and they saw it and they're like, yeah, we want to take that. And I, and I was shocked, you know, I was expecting to, um, go into a bunch of different galleries and get shot down, but they said, yeah, that's great. We'll hang it up. And, um, and then it sold. And, um, I can't even remember how much it sold for, you know, maybe like maybe around a thousand dollars or a little less or something like that, which for me at that time was like, that, uh, that was a lot of money. And I was just like, are you serious? Like, I couldn't believe that that happened. And, um, so that was kind of a turning point because before that it was just something that I did for fun. And, you know, as another expression of how much I loved fishing, you know, it was whatever, you know, and up here in the winter time, there's not a whole lot to do. So, um, you know, I'd make paintings of the fish where the fish weren't here anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, that, that was sort of like an inflection point where then I started thinking, started thinking, well, geez, you know, like I could actually, um, possibly do this for a living yeah so that's awesome man that that uh i mean like a a moment like that is when you look back at that i mean how much confidence did you like had you not gone down there and tried to sell that painting do you think things would have been different or like i don't know there's a couple of things where i think about i'm like i don't even know why i did that but that was a huge Mm -hmm. point in my life and had Mm -hmm. had that not happened i don't know like if I would have had the confidence or the momentum or whatever to go on and do right. whatever, whatever it is that, that happened. But that seems like, that seems like a moment that was like mm-hmm. really important. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I probably didn't even realize it at the time, you know? Um, but, uh, yeah, that was, that was, that, that was a real eye opener. And, um, you know, and then, then I started, you know, selling paintings on the side, like from there on out. That's cool. Did that school bus mm-hmm. have air conditioning in it? No. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> is that summertime? Summertime work? I would. I would imagine that oh, this thing is covered yeah. in sweat. If that's yeah. uh, if that's the case, because uh, a school bus mm-hmm. in the summertime would be uh, sweltering. I mean, it was a little bit in the shade. You know, there's some palm trees yeah. over it, but still. Uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Big pine, 
shade yep. is like uh well it's like the tom mcguane book 92 in the shade uh mm -hmm. <laughs> in the 92 in a school bus um well nick it's been awesome to uh to get to know you i hope that we can do this again on the podcast we probably we barely even scratched the surface on uh on your art know, and what likewise. you're doing and and uh, uh -huh. we, but but you know like i say most people that listen to the podcast don't particularly like wrestling talk so we have that going for us. Uh, no, I mean, there, there's, a ton, there's a ton of wrestling fishermen on that, that listen to this. And uh, mm -hmm. they, they send me messages all the time like, hey, man, I love the, the wrestling. Uh, or, or, you know, my, I wrestled or, or my brother wrestles or I don't know. I, there, there are a lot of people, like I say, man, there are a lot of people that do this type mm -hmm. of fishing that, that are, are wrestlers or have been wrestlers or enjoy the sport. Like Clay Guida. My favorite UFC fighter because he uh -huh. is a wrestler and um, also crazy fisherman, man. That guy. Do you know him, the caveman? Uh, I, I don't. I gotta check him out. Oh yeah, he's he's in the Hall of Fame now. But uh, the funny thing about okay. Clay Guida is that he loves wrestling and wrestling. He'll he'll tell you that wrestling saved his life and he learned all the same lessons that we're talking about uh, mm -hmm. and more. But then he was just a kind of what he'll say is a mediocre wrestler. He wasn't a state champion. He 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 uh, just loved it, and he has a good skill set. And then he went on to start fighting in the UFC, and he's had over fifty fights in the UFC, and and he's got a tremendous wrestling base. And and uh, hit one of his hashtags is wrestling is life. That's what he that's what he puts on all his hashtags. But awesome. I had an opportunity to fish with him a, a couple times, and he's. Uh, Man, he loves fishing as much as anybody I've ever I've ever been with, and uh, he's he's awesome. Cool. Well, tell us how um, well, if if somebody wants to, if they're interested in in what you do and your art, and uh, um, tell us how they they see more, buy more. What? How do you do it? So it's nickmayerart.com is my website. So it's n i c k m a y e r a r t. And that's that's the main place you can see my work. You can see all my got a bunch of Florida species, you know, redfish, tarpon, snook, bonefish, permit. Yeah. Yeah. All so, kinds of stuff, though. And you got, I sell, you got all um, kinds of stuff on your. Yeah. On your I mean, page. that's kind of like my another sort of like my philosophy is, you know, my bigger mission is with all of this is to connect people with nature. And, you know, I, I feel like in, in this this era of people being on their phones and in front of screens all the time, you know, that's really important. Yes. But uh, also like introducing art into everyday life, you know, like not everybody can afford um, an original painting to put on their wall. But, um, you know, having having like nature inspired art on like a phone case or a bag or you know things like that that come into everyday life i just feel like it helps sort of like you know connect people with nature so yeah. i love it i love it well i've enjoyed the conversation definitely and uh, i hope that you guys will go check out his stuff it's he's got some really really beautiful stuff out there and um definitely check out his website all right nick Thanks so much, man. We'll do it again. We'll stay in touch. Thanks so much, Tom. Yeah. It was a pleasure. Yeah, great conversation. Thanks for having me.